All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see many of you here in person and lovely also to hear from many of you on the online world. Um, I wanna specifically call out and thank uh, many members of the Dean's office who are here online today and uh, Liz Concordia and Tom Gorna who are also here online today with us as well. Uh, welcome to the last grand rounds of the year, the state of the state for the annual Department of Medicine. Uh, and my first address uh, to you about the department itself. So I thought long and hard about this talk today, and I'm gonna frame my comments in three buckets. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the past and most recent past since my coming here to set the context. I'm gonna talk about the present and where we are today, and I'm gonna dazzle you and razzle you with a lot of data and facts. Uh, it'll come fast, but I also wanna impress upon you that that's because there's a lot to talk about and a lot of things that I take pride in. And then I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about the future uh, and where we're going. So let me begin with the past. Um, and my past began here in Colorado in November of last year where we were facing our first surge of Omicron. All of you remember these days. I know you thought maybe there'd be no COVID today, sorry. There's a little bit of COVID conversation and uh, we were stretched pretty thin uh, when COVID hit. Uh, I was pleased that we were able to continue our department's legacy of sharing timely information. We continued with our COVID-19 updates, and we had experts from all over the world uh, available and joining us with sharing best practice so that we did the best we could for our patients. Uh, I also firsthand witnessed what was happening in healthcare in terms of the workforce. Uh, this is data starting from the beginning of the pandemic, where we knew that medical workers were leaving or quitting in numbers never seen before. And if you look at the top four reasons here, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was a big one. So was money and financial security. So was opportunity. And so was feeling burned out and overworked. And heaven forbid, we know a little bit about feeling burned out and overworked. How do you make a bad situation good? Well, you address what you can. And I was pleased that when we got our CARES allocation of funds, we sent many of you, trainees, faculty, staff, educators, leaders, uh, this email uh, where we provided every single cent that we got from CARES funding back to all of you as a small way of saying thanks. And look, money can't solve all the problems of the world, but this was the right thing to do. And I'm glad that we were able to do it. I thought this was the end of the dark times and we can look forward. I was wrong. Uh, we had this big war breakout in Ukraine, horrifying stories, atrocities. And while it was sad to hear, I said, well, that's not really gonna affect us uh, here in Colorado. I was wrong again. Uh, this is economic data from the International Monetary Fund showing what's happening with gross domestic product across the world. I want to pay attention to the U.S. there in the left-hand side of your slides. We are seeing a six-fold decrease in our gross domestic product here nationally. And all of you have felt this uh, in the dark economic times that we have seen here as well. Why does this matter to you? Because it matters to our health system. Uh, this is data from Becker's Hospital Review showing what's happening in healthcare funding in the country today. That blue part of the pie is wages and salaries. On average, that's about 30% of a health system's cost. It is now twice that. Uh, and it is certainly happening not just here, but happening across the world. And so labor and wages have become a huge unplanned expense. And you know what they say about unplanned expenses? It's gotta be paid for somewhere. This isn't happening just here in Colorado. It's happening across the nation. This is data from Liz, who shared this with me at a UC Health Leadership Update. And what you see here is some very big names, Cleveland Clinic, Mass General Brigham, Penn Medicine, what I would consider our peer institutions, all showing negative margins and negative fiscal productivity. So you look at us, we're that red bar, we're on the right. Well, great. We work in a system that's able to make this work. That's reassuring. But a single point in time does not a story tell, because if you look at where we are with our trend on our economic margins, uh, they're not heading the right direction. And this is because expenses are far greater than what we had budgeted. And this is because revenue has not kept up in that sense as well. So I'm starting with the past with a little bit of darkness to it, but I wanna tell you that I do believe that there are bright lights and bright spots ahead. Let me share with you some of them. All of the challenges we have seen have allowed us to renew and re-emphasize our focus on wellness. We have an incredible team here in the Department of Medicine that has been doing this for years. And I feel very blessed and privileged to have them here among us, many of whom are here today, to help, help us uh, focus on wellness of our staff and our faculty. You look around the campus, you couldn't tell we are in dark times economically. Uh, we have fancy, beautiful new buildings coming up around us. That's Tower 3. That's taken about a month ago. It looks different already. 
uh, and we have bright things to look forward to in terms of our clinical enterprise. When a market goes down, you must diversify your portfolio of practice, and we have been doing that. And I am very grateful to Greg Austin, shown here in the upper right-hand corner, our Vice Chair of Community Affairs, uh, who has helped us renegotiate and rebuild many of our community practices, including in cardiology, GI, palliative care, and oncology. And personally for me, what's been the brightest spot has been welcoming new people to our leadership team. Uh, in geriatrics, in rheumatology, we have new chiefs. We have three new vice chairs for research, uh, and we've got a new vice chair for faculty development and mentorship. So yes, it's been hard, but I wanna focus now on the present and tell you I think that we're in really good shape. So when I talk about the present, I want us to focus maybe on three key themes. I hope you feel this and see this in the slides I share. The first is a, a focus I've had on building community and building purpose, not just within the department, but within departments, divisions, sections, and across all of our employees, faculty, staff, PRAs, and trainees. It's theme number one. I'll highlight that as and when I can. Theme number two has been about uh, change. Uh, I would say this past year has been a time of great change, and you'll see a lot of that um, in the slides that are coming up as well. And last but not least, I've been very intentional and very focused on growing people and growing programs. Uh, you will see examples of this uh, throughout the presentation today, and I would invite many questions about this because I truly think our greatest asset is our people, uh, and my greatest responsibility is growing them and growing our programs here on campus and beyond. So those are the three key themes. Let's go around the world in the Department of Medicine. Uh, I'm going to start on the far left, tell you about our people and leaders, and move into research, quality, and safety. I'll share with you some of our clinical metrics and clinical data. Uh, I'll walk into department finances and investments that we're making into the department so you know where we're spending our money, not mine or yours, our money. Uh, and I will highlight diversity and equity initiatives as well as educational initiatives uh, that we have taken on in the past year as well. Let me begin by telling you about our most precious asset, our people. Uh, I am incredibly grateful for this group of leaders uh, who provide me with counsel and wisdom every single day. These are our vice chairs in the Department of Medicine. Uh, you'll see a lot of new faces here. Uh, Dr. Sharma, uh, our new Vice Chair for Faculty Development and Mentorship. Dr. Janine Higgins, who is sitting here in the front row. Thank you, Janine, uh, who is our Vice Chair for Research. And two of our Associate Vice Chairs, Dr. Mary Weiser Evans and Dr. Fernanda Holguin, who are also sitting here in the front row of the, of the building. Um, I could not have asked for a better uh, group of people to, advise, uh, to offer advice and help lead the department. I could also have not asked for a better team around me. We have an incredible administrative team in the Department of Medicine. Um, these are many of the faces that do the hard work of HR, of finances. Being a department chair is basically about three things, operations, HR, and finances. And these are the people that do those three things in the Department of Medicine. Uh, a lot of new faces on this slide. Uh, so these are people that have been hired in the past year uh, since I have been here. Uh, again, time of great change, uh, time of building community and people. That change doesn't just happen here on Anschutz, it's also happened across our affiliates. Uh, we are better because of our affiliates. When I first started, Dr. Kesh Jani was my partner in crime at the VA. Uh, this is now Dr. Larry Borg, who is our interim chief of medicine there as well. Kevin Brown has endured the times and remains my partner at National Jewish, and we are going to see change at Denver Health as well, with Dr. Ed Havernick turning the reins over to Dr. Anupar Njepe, who will be here in May of 2023. Two new leaders uh, across three of our affiliates. And I can tell you all about the department, but I will tell you the thing that matters the most is what happens in your divisions. And we have incredible leaders in our divisions here on campus. We have 14 divisions in the Department of Medicine. I wanna highlight two new faces for you. Uh, Christy Kuhn, who is here, our new Chief of Rheumatology, and Carrie Levy, who is also here, our new Chief of Geriatrics. I'm particularly pleased that we see more women in leadership in the Department of Medicine. This is intentional, and, and this will, there'll be more of this to come uh, as we move forward. Uh, speaking of more to come, there's more changes that are going to happen here. Uh, these are four division chiefs who have selflessly come to the table to serve in a time of need as interims. Uh, we are actively searching for our new chiefs in allergy, in cardiology, in endocrinology, and in gastroenterology. I will share we're very close in gastroenterology, and all the other three searches are active and underway. And I anticipate next year when I give you this talk, there'll be some new faces uh, on this screen as well. Why do our divisions and our leadership matter so much? Um, they matter because of you, because of our people in the Department of Medicine. You know, these numbers are pretty outstanding. 14 divisions, 1,205 regular faculty, 
857 faculty across various positions in our affiliates, 188 advanced practice providers, 928 research and administrative staff, 156 fellows and 188 residents. Yes, we're a family. We're a big family at the end of the day. And managing a lot of this work comes down to a, a key group of people, which is our division administrators. So these are people that partner with their division heads to make the everyday happen every single day seamlessly. Uh, the ones in red are new names. These are new people that have joined the department in the past year. And, you know, I talked about community. These are pictures from our outings. We've been doing outings to kind of build a sense of cohesion among our team. This was at the Denver Biscuit Company in the bottom. I will say that there was a lot of food consumed. A lot of food went home uh, as well, but it was an important time for all of us to bond. And this is just as important as the work, right? Understanding that we are connected in deeper ways so that the work actually becomes that much easier to do. Look, the work is actually easier because we have great people in the Department of Medicine. This is a snapshot of five years worth of data. And the numbers still amaze me. We've had 283 promotions, appointments, and tenure in the Department of Medicine. Uh, I want to call out Stu Linus and Nada Rasuli, who is also here, who have led the committees and done all the hard work, looking at the dossiers, giving feedback, really pushing the cause for our faculty to achieve their promotional ranks. We have at 172 move from assistant to associate, 54 moving from associate to full, and 22 awards of tenure, one of which I will claim is mine. Um, and so we have made tremendous progress because of our greatest asset, our people. So it was a pleasure for me this year to actually welcome us all back in person. Uh, this was our annual staff and faculty recognition event. Uh, I took a sample of photos here. Um, I hope you feel the energy and love in these pictures. It really was quite a, a spectacular night. People were happy to see one another. Uh, there was joy in the room, and we were thrilled to have Reshma Jaxi here, who is now the Department Chair of Radiation Oncology, share her journey uh, in gender equity, but also share her journey from an academic perspective of being a woman in medicine. Uh, and I say all of us took away pearls of knowledge from her talk that night. New this year, we actually introduced a new category for our staff. Uh, we've always had a faculty recognition event, but the staff are the ones that make the faculty shine. And I was really pleased to be able to shine the spotlight on these four very incredible people. Uh, they do incredible work in the department, in their divisions, but also in their research programs and clinical units. And this will be a staple moving forward. We will continue to have a place for staff at our annual recognition awards event as well. So that's about the people. Let's tell you a little bit about the research happening in the Department of Medicine. We have... 1,132 funded projects in the Department of Medicine today. We have $356.9 million in funding from federal, non-federal, and other sources, including clinical trials and industry. And we are ranked number 24 in the nation on the Blue Ridge rankings when it comes to federal dollars. You see this, and I was impressed to see this, but the truth of the matter is we're this good, again, because of our affiliates. Um, this is data that I got from our three sites showing you how they contribute to our research missions. At Denver Health, we have 21 PIs from the Department of Medicine who run 59 projects and bring in $12.5 million of funding. At the VA, we have 28 PIs who are doing running 48 projects and $14.5 million of funding. And at National Jewish, we have 72 PIs from the Department of Medicine, 372 grants, and $92.5 million worth of funding. We are better, we are unique, we are stronger because of our partnerships with our affiliates. And research is no exception to this rule. So when you think about all this research funding, we should be the envy of the country. And the truth is we are. This is data on honorific societies occupied by the faculty here in the Department of Medicine. We have 22 elected members of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. We have seven elected American Association of Physician members and six masters of the American College of Physicians. That is all great because these are truly the nation's elite. I think we can do better here because I know the talent that exists in this department. And this will be an important area of growth for me and for us going forward. And I wanna highlight that bottom piece. It's really gonna come through intentional mentorship and intentional sponsorship. Uh, and that is something that we are gonna be very focused on moving forward as well. I'm gonna stick with the research theme and I'm gonna show you more data that will dazzle and razzle you. This is our research output in peer reviewed publications. So I did this this morning to update that last bar graph on the right. This calendar year, our faculty published 2,482 peer-reviewed publications. That's 200 a month on average. Um, and I don't know about you, that's pretty incredible uh, at the end of the day. And notice that trend line, 
it's moving upwards. Um, it's not as if we're going to slow this down. I expect next year again, we'll be higher uh, in this respect. And you may look at this and say, oh, it's the quantity. The quantity is great. What about the quality? Uh, this is data that I took off PubMed using that scraping search at the bottom, uh, looking at the top journals in medicine. This year alone, we have published 18 New England Journal of Medicine articles, 26 in Annals, 11 in Lancet. Let me tell you, people go their entire careers without a paper in these journals, and we have multiple people publishing here as well. And it's across the spectrum in science, in cell, and in PNAS, we also hit the high leagues when it comes to research. This is something I'm very proud of. This is not easy. And this is because we have incredible talent here in the Department of Medicine. So how do we fare nationally in our research rankings? This is the NIH ranking taken from the Blue Ridge rankings. There's good news here and there's bad news here. The good news is we're fairly stable in the low 20s. We have been very stable. Why is that good news? Because everyone is going up in their dollar amounts every year. So we're actually maintaining and keeping up and keeping pace. The sort of bad news is we haven't gotten better. And I firmly believe we can get better. We should get better, and it is the department's responsibility to help us get better. So this is where my three aces come in, uh, Janine, Mary, and Fernando. Um, I tasked them with putting together a strategy for us to really crack that top 20 ranking. And they said, well, we don't know what the right strategy is, so we got to go and listen. So they've been on step one here on a listening tour. Many of you, I hope, have interacted with them. Uh, they've had one session for every division for the physician and PhD faculty and a separate session for APPs, for PRAs, and for staff, trying to understand both of the challenges in both of those worlds. They are now finishing up their listening sessions and will develop a strategic plan for the Department of Medicine. Uh, that plan will include reviewing our current programs and offerings, uh, understanding and addressing where gaps are, and thinking about ways to accelerate our progress in research. Uh, the goal is to share that plan with all of you in the first quarter of 2023, get your feedback and input. And then that bottom cube, cube number three, the goal is to enact that plan in summer of 2023. Janine knows how I feel about this. This is a key priority of ours in the Department of Medicine, and I'm delighted at the progress we've made in a very short time and the progress we will make going forward as well. Quality is really important in the care we deliver every day. And uh, I will say this without any shame or without any hesitation, I believe we are the leaders on campus when it comes to quality and safety for how we provide care in the hospital. These are data on what's called gateway metrics that the system sets for us for quality. Uh, they're essentially based on things you must do to be eligible for the quality incentive, uh, documentation in terms of compliance with queries, Consult optimization and OPPE are the three targets here. And I want you to look at the right side of this slide. We not only meet these criteria, we hit them 100% of the times, all the time. Uh, and that is pretty spectacular when you compare us to other departments across the campus. Uh, we also have uh, performance metrics that we're held accountable to. And here's where I think we have opportunities. So those four metrics are our mortality, uh, people that die in the hospital uh, using Vizient benchmarks, readmissions for our Medicaid population in 30 days, the patient experience question, which I know we can debate until the, the cows come home, but did you feel listened to by your provider using HCAPS data? And then our clinic access work, which I know many of you have heard me talk about and worked on this past year. The numbers aren't the greatest here, but we're actually inching the right direction um, and we're coming closer to reaching these targets as well. One important change I made this year was to take away the quality control from the central of the department, but actually thinking about including divisions and being more purposeful and intentional about how they inform our quality work. So I asked Dr. Ho, who leads our quality work, to form a quality council. Um, that's the group huddling together. These are the 13 people from our clinical divisions who meet and inform our quality work. They give us critical feedback on um, this metric is great, but here's why it doesn't work. Or here's what we do in our clinic when it comes to clinic and consults, and they provide that reality of workflow as it relates to measurement. Um, and they meet every so often. I've been at various meetings here, and the energy and the excitement and the enthusiasm for delivering better care uh, is pretty impressive. Um, the Quality Council only works because we have great leaders in quality. So I want to publicly acknowledge and thank Michael Ho, who's here as well, uh, Anunta Virapangse, Tyler Anstead, who's also here I saw, who lead our quality work, but also the backbone behind them. Heather Hallman, Homer Antancio, and Nick Olson, who provide data and analytics uh, in our quality initiatives. Why does all this matter? Sure, it's important to give good care to patients. It also matters for who we are nationally. We are a thing nationally. Um, this is newest news and world report rankings, and we have uh, several programs that meet the top 50 list in the country in diabetes and endocrinology, in gastroenterology, in pulmonary and rheumatology. 
And we are high performing, which means we're not in the top 50, but we're in the top 100 in cancer and in geriatrics. Uh, this is great, but is, I am not satisfied with this. I think we should be ranked higher. I think those high performing groups should move up. And uh, Michael and I and many others are working on a strategy to really think about how we influence and move us up to where we belong, in my mind, on the national rankings for the US News and World Report. So more to come there uh, in the work of our quality team as well. I'm gonna jump from quality to clinical productivity. Um, this has been, I think, the most impressive slide that I put together here. The left side shows you our clinical productivity in the outpatient side. This is a combination of both ENM billing and CPT codes for the procedures. And year upon year, over the past five years, that clinical volume has been increasing over time. I know you all feel it. Uh, I know I feel it because my wife comes home and tells me about it. Uh, and this is because it's hard work uh, and it's been accelerated unsurpassed here in the department. It's also been the same place on the inpatient side. We're always full. We're 110 to 120% full in most days. And we continue to squeeze every corner of the hospital for bed space. Uh, this year alone, we touched almost 285,000 people uh, in terms of discharges from our faculty. That is incredible. When you think about that clinical work, you should think about the work relative value units. This is how we measure quantify work. And since 2018, that work has increased by almost 30%. Um, so this shows you kind of our work RVUs, 1.04 million to 1.42 million uh, this current fiscal year. I wanna also actually call it the bottom gray part of the graph. That's the RVUs generated outside of Anschutz in our community practices. And I will tell you in the next five years, that gray bar is gonna grow because we're gonna really focus very intentionally in how we build our practices outside of campus so that we do the things that need to be done here and the things that don't need to be done out uh, in places where we can do them safely as well. So stay tuned for that little port bottom portion of the graph. As our work has gone up, so too has clinical income. This is clinical income across the departments, so all the department, all the divisions, all of our contracts. This year, we exceeded $100 million in terms of our annual income in the Department of Medicine. That's a lot of moolah. Uh, and people said to me, that's great. We should be investing more in all these programs and doing all these other things. And I, I completely agree. And that's what I've been doing over the past year. This is our operating expenses in the Department of Medicine, where we spend our money. And over the past two fiscal years, that expense rate has gone up. And I think that's a good thing because we should be putting money back into our department and back into our divisions. Let me give you a sense of where this money is being spent. The Department of Medicine has a $14.5 million annual budget. That's what we get from all of the clinical work and research work that comes our way. The vast share of this is goes back to divisions in the form of academic incentives, retentions, recruitments, and startups. Uh, the, last, the second two chunks that are larger is our education programs and the resources needed to run our department, including those for our staff, our vice chairs, and our division administrators as well. Uh, I want to call out the two smaller slices of the pie, our research programs, which are about 1.8 million, and our signature programs, as I call them, things like PAGE, Grand Rounds, Weldom, our clinician educator program, and DREAM, which is our pipeline program, uh, which also accounts for a million dollars of expenses. And I will say that if you look at this over year over year, my, my anticipation is that those two slices of the pie, the dollars that go to research and the dollars that go to signature programs are going to increase. Uh, because I think there's the greatest need there and the greatest opportunity there for us to actually invest back into people, invest back into programs to do good things. I typically get this slide at a department talk and I don't know what he's talking about or what they're talking about. What does this mean? Let me give you some tangible examples of what this means and how we spent money this year. Uh, we invested in increasing salaries in infectious diseases. Uh, we partnered with the hospital to increase salaries for hospital medicine. And we did the same for some of our hematology providers as well. Uh, we modernized our hiring practices here on campus. Denver's great to recruit to, but it's not easy to recruit when half the workforce is leaving the workforce, as I showed you. So we have uh, search firms that we now have on board to help us recruit everything from clinical folks to leaders, and the department provides matching support for those search firm recruitments to make it easier on divisions. And last but not least, I was more than pleased to provide commitments of support for 30 plus grant proposals. Uh, these uh, support commitments range from $75,000 to almost a million dollars if funded. Um, that is what I should be doing is supporting more research and guaranteeing support helps the grant be more successful, also helps our investigators be more successful. So these are just three small ways that I can show you where money has gone back into the divisions and into programs as well. A key theme of my talk today is people, um, the people in this room, the people online. Um, I am very proud of the diversity of our people. 
And, and this goes to a full credit to Sonia Flores, who's been our vice chair of diversity and equity. And I actually asked Sonia this year, I said, what are we doing to increase diversity so that we're talking among our divisions about what's happening, but also managing our workflow to think about their needs? So Sonia, uh, at my ask, formed this diversity council in the Department of Medicine. Uh, the idea here is that there's three goals. DEI principles are completely embedded in how we hire, how we retain, and how we recruit, that we provide bi-directional support for activities between the department and the divisions, and we think about not where we are, but where we need to be, because there's a long way to go on this journey. So let's skate to where the puck is going to be with new areas of strategic growth and investment. What Sonia did was she brought the group together and she organized them into three different subcommittees. So this is who they are. Uh, I'm not going to read all their names. You know these names on these on this table. Uh, their focus is different. So subcommittee one is focused on outreach and they do things like who are our grand round speakers and are we being diverse and intentional on who we're bringing in here as well. They're also going to focus on our new program, our mini DEI fellowships and grants, where we're going to provide support to enhance DEI in divisions across the department. Subcommittee two is focused on our environment. What does it feel like to be a faculty staff trainee here on campus? Uh, and this includes our PhD task force that I'm meeting with on Friday to understand some of their needs, but also includes things like our race corrections in our EHR and our equity and oversight committees. Uh, and subcommittee three that I've relied on very heavily this year is our recruitment and our retention committee, really thinking about how we bring people on, how we structure recruitment processes to be fair and unbiased and how we think a lot about growing people once they're here as well. I, I think the reason we have more women in leadership now than when I first started is because of the work of this group. Um, it really has been transformative. It does work when you set up the system the right way. So I'm very grateful to all the names on this slide. I, I'm also grateful because when it comes to diversity, we need a pipeline for that. And the pipeline is here. Uh, it's this man here on the right, Dr. Jeff Connors, who is our vice chair for education, but also our program director for the residency program and all of our associate and assistant directors who do the hard work of training our residents and our fellows every single day. I also wanna point out David Schwartz here, our former chair of medicine, who's been an incredible partner to me this year, who has stayed on to help with our physician scientist training program and ensure that we have a pipeline there for our future science and recruits. Why do I say they're second to none? Because look at where we're getting our residents from. Uh, this is a heat map that shows you where residents come to, uh, to Colorado. The darker color, the more the residents. Colorado is very dark. That's good because we have a great medical school here and we have great talent right here. Uh, but look at the other areas of the country. Literally, we get people from every single coast um, and they come here because they want to come here. Uh, they want to be part of this incredible community of trainees. What's really impressive about this, staying on the diversity theme, is that we attract diverse trainees. So year after year, I know Jeff has talked to me about this. This has been very intentional, very focused. We have increased the number of diversity, uh, diverse trainees in our residency program. Today, one in five of our trainees would call themselves an underrepresented minority uh, in, our, in our residency program. I will tell you, I know programs on the coast that have more of that in their population that don't have these numbers as well. This is really phenomenal and terrific work. It doesn't end at the residence. Uh, it also it continues in our fellowship programs. We just came off our fellowship match. I think we had a wonderful match this year, and we are going to welcome 137 new fellows, uh, 22 different specialties, more than half of whom are women uh, as our workforce, and more than one in three who identify as underrepresented in medicine. I was on a chairs call last week with chairs across the country. They were blown away by this. How do you, how do you guys do that? Um, and I frankly don't know how we do it. I think Dr. Connors knows how we do it. Um, but it is an area that I am very intentional about wanting to grow and invest into. So this year, uh, we made some significant investments in our education portfolio. Uh, we invested resources to create a new formal point of care ultrasound program. Uh, this provides curricular support, including dedicated faculty support to teach our residents about this tool. I think the days of stethoscopes may be behind us and you should have the best tools in your toolbox as you go out in the real world. Um, we were also pleased to get a philanthropic gift in the education program, which I was happy to match to increase the value of those dollars. And we introduced a new curriculum. I see Amaran sitting in the back on diagnostic reasoning uh, and diagnostic training. And Amaran has that position now in the residency program uh, as a result of funding that we've committed to doing uh, in the department. Look, I, I care deeply about our residents, and not because they're a fun group, they are a fun group, um, but because they are the future leaders. Um, but you know, when you ask them about leadership, uh, they look at me like, what does that even mean? So this year, we launched a leadership book club with our chief residents. I see all the chiefs looking down at their feet right now. Um, 
we thought we should read texts, come together and talk about how we would learn uh, from that and apply that to our day-to-day -day work. This is a picture of all of us. Uh, yes, there were some libations involved. Libations and leadership go together. Uh, where we talked about Good to Great, uh, our first book. Uh, our next book is going to be the first 90 days, Opportune, as they think about new journeys in their career. Uh, Radical Candor is our third book. And our last book, which selected by the Chiefs, uh, called Inclusion on Purpose. And so I'm excited about not only doing this, but learning from them uh, and the fact that we're able to actually give them some pearls of leadership and knowledge uh, as they go on their journeys as well. So that's a lot. Um, that's our past and that's our present. Uh, I'm going to spend the next maybe 15 to 20 minutes talking about the future. You know the Yogi Berra quote, the future is hard to predict. I'm not going to say it, um, but I'm going to give you my conceptual framework for how I'm thinking about the future. And I'm going to share with you a lot of things that are happening now, but a lot of things that need to happen. So I'm going to begin within that center nucleus, the department, and how we're thinking about innovations in the department. Uh, I'm thinking about faculty a lot, and I'm going to talk about faculty support and well-being. Uh, I will address uh, UC Health and our relations. I know that's been on many of your minds, and I want to talk about it. Uh, and last, I'm going to close with national presence and branding. Um, and so let me begin by telling you about some really cool things happening in the department with innovations. I'm a research scientist, and I believe in making data-driven decisions. But the truth is, in the Department of Medicine, we don't have a lot of data sources. And when you think a lot about salary and equity on salary, there's a shocking paucity of what we know to be true versus what we think to be true in the department. This is problematic on so many levels, but it's more problematic that we haven't solved this conundrum in a way that's actually manageable and in a way that's transparent so that everyone knows what those numbers look like. So this year I hired Stephen Newcomb. Stephen is the former GI division administrator. He is now the head of data analytics in the Department of Medicine. And I tasked Steve with creating dashboards for us. So this was no longer a black box going forward. So this is our salary equity dashboard. Point number one, these are all fake numbers. So don't start looking for your names on the salary. Uh, point number two is that this is truly an amazing tool. So on the upper left, you'll see the first little graph there. That's sort of the breakdown of men versus women, blue for men, pink for women. Uh, on the bottom, you see a box and whisker plot that gives you the distribution of salaries by MD, by PhD, again, with blue and yellow pink dots for men versus women. In the center, that big scatter plot, essentially our two axes, salary on the left and yours in rank on the right. Uh, pink dots for women, blue dots for men. And you can see what happens when you plot this through this all on the board. You see a lot of clustering, which is good. But when you draw average lines, you see deltas. Again, hypothetical data, not real. Um, and you also see a trend line where we're going on our salaries overall in the Department of Medicine. I can't show this to you here in an interactive way, but you can actually click on each of these dots. It'll pop up a name of a faculty member, their division, where they are, what rank they are, and more details. So we can interrogate this data in a very transparent way. On the far right, you see our slicer dicer options. We can do this by division. So I can see equity by division in a way that I could not see before. You can see it by rank. You can see it by degrees. You can see it by affiliation. So how many of them are here versus Denver Health versus BA. And you can see it by their primary function. Are they clinicians? Are they APPs? Are they PhDs? Are they part of a specific section? And because community practice and transplant have different compensation models, we can also break it up by community and transplant models. Pretty cool, right? Um, wasn't really hard to do. Uh, the data was there. All we needed was clear vision initiative and a way to link it all together in this transparent way. Uh, what have we done with this? we set a new process up for our mid-year salary adjustments this year. So uh, when I first got here, I got all these table one salary adjustments and I was told we're making equity adjustments, but there was no way for me to tell. We can tell now. So I asked all of our division administrators and leaders to make their adjustments using the dashboard, uh, looking at their individual division faculty members to understand where gaps were. They then proposed those adjustments that came to us in the department. We signed off in all of those adjustments and we did the same thing looking at that same dashboard, looking at things like gender, like years and rank, looking at track and a number of different opportunities. Three things I'll say about this. Number one, it simplified the process dramatically. Last time we did this, I think it was eight hours or nine hours of work plus countless hours in the back end. So that was great. Number two, we found issues that we called out um, and actually divisions were very appreciative and respectful. And number three, the thing that was the most sort of unexpected in all of this is I actually heard back from faculty directly who said, wow, I just received a huge bump. How did that happen? Uh, I, I think they were shocked, number one, but two, they didn't understand why. Uh, so those are the kinds of emails I like to get because I can give people good news as to how we're doing things going forward. So this is gonna be 
a, a key part of who we are. Uh, and I think we've had a long history here on salary equity. Uh, I know we've done this in PAGE and a number of different areas. This will be our standard going forward so that it's clear and transparent as well. We've done the same thing for research. I know Janine is very pleased to have this tool. This is our research dashboard, again, created by Steve Newcomb. Uh, you can see the number of funded projects we have on the upper left. You can see our total funding. You can see our Blue Ridge ranking, and you can also see our success rate. So for every grant or every contract we put in, how many of those actually hit? And I would say one in four, that's a pretty good batting average for a major department of medicine. On the left, you can see how many proposals we put in per year. And in the middle, you can see funding by divisions. And those numbers are real. So you can see funding broken down by federal, non-federal sources, by industry, by other sources as well. And in one place, you have a sense of where our divisions are excelling in research and where we have opportunities to grow our portfolio. The bottom is our burn rate. It shows you expenses over time. So you can actually see how we're burning the money that we're getting through federal and non-federal funding. And on the right, you have things like proposal analytics. So we can dive into individual proposals. We can look at funding analytics and we can look at expense reports. Um, I don't know why we didn't have this tool. I'm grateful we have this tool. To my knowledge, we're the only department that has this tool. Uh, and I think this will provide us with incredible insight in terms of how our research activities are going as well. We're just getting started on this innovation journey. We're gonna build an education dashboard going next. So at one place, a learner, a faculty member can see how they're performing uh, without having to look at MedHub or whatever other data sources we look at now. And more importantly, I think we need to build something for promotion. Um, our promotion process here is very convoluted. Um, it's very opaque. Uh, I would say I've received more emails uh, that are unhelpful uh, about the promotion process than I care to comment on. And I think it really annoys faculty. It annoys me in, as in, in my role as well. So we're gonna start to be more intentional about this, building this dashboard, looking at actions, looking at tenure, looking at years and rank, and more importantly, looking for readiness. So when we start to see people moving up, we need to start to think about them moving up as well. And this will be a partnership with my division heads, really thinking about who is ready and who is not using that same data source. So this is great and innovations are really important. I also wanna share with you what I've been focusing on as well, which is philanthropy. Um, we are in a very good position on campus in the Department of Medicine. This is our total philanthropy in terms of endowed chairs. Uh, for those of you who may not know, an endowed chair is a chair that has a value of $2 million and above. These chairs spin off $100,000 a year for, for funds you can use for a number of activities and programs. Uh, each year in the Department of Medicine, we have organically grown that number of chairs. We have 65 of these now in the Department of Medicine that benefit our faculty. 23 of these are held by faculty, but they live outside the department. So we get the proceeds, but the funds actually aren't here directly as well. And as I mentioned, we have the most endowed chairs in the School of Medicine. So this is great. Uh, why am I sharing this slide with you? Uh, it's because I have a big, hairy, audacious goal. I want to double this number to 84 chairs in the next five years. Uh, why? Uh, because these chairs provide support for our academic missions. The dollars that spin off these chairs go back to divisions, they go back to faculty, they go back to programs. They don't live with me, they go back to you. So it supports people, it supports initiatives that otherwise will have no support uh, to actually carry on. And it is a great and important tool as we think about recruitment and retention within divisions. Let me tell you the top 20 programs in the country, they're all doing this. Um, we need to do better here as well. And you may be shocked to say, wow, double the number. I mean, we've only We've gotten to where we are over so many years. How can we double? Uh, I actually want to tell you we're well on our way to this goal. So I want to call out and thank Allison Krebs, Marty Lal, Haley Nelson, and Carly Werbos, who I meet with every month. I meet with them with Brian Haugen, actually, who is tremendously gifted at raising funds and money. So if you need money, go to Brian. Don't go to me. Um, we've had 92 unique conversations this year alone about philanthropy, uh, led by a faculty member in our Department of Medicine. These are conversations where the, the amounts proposed for gifts were $10,000 or higher. And, you know, the millions sound great and it sounds very intimidating. Let me be clear. These gifts range from anywhere from $5 all the way up to the most recent rate of gift of $20 million. And the key with philanthropy is when somebody gives once, they like to give again. Uh, they want to see their dollars do good things for our missions and their interests, number two. And number three, they often give test gifts. They want to see how the money is used before they commit to more. So I treat each one of these with the same attention, uh, no matter what the dollar amount as well. This will be an area for us to talk more about, uh, because I'm going to need your help as faculty to help with these gifts along the way. Grateful patients, donors, benefactors, etc. Uh, this only happens because we all do it together.
All right, so that's department innovations. Let me talk about faculty support and well-being as the next key area for ourselves. Um, I will tell you it's been a very hard year uh, for all of us. I have felt that too. Uh, and I will tell you that um, that hardness this year is not isolated. It's been there in medicine for a very long time, perhaps magnified this year, given all that we've been through. Uh, that's why I'm very grateful to Katie Morrison, who's also here today. Um, the Department of Medicine has had a prolonged focus on wellness that predates COVID. Uh, we were looking at this issue before the storm hit. Uh, and this slide shows you where we've been doing the work. In 2019, we conducted surveys looking specifically at staff, at APPs, at physicians, and at researchers. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, we continue this work with more detailed surveys, more focus groups, more data gathering, really thinking about how we need to react and inform our wellness work. Uh, these data tell the same story. Um, a lot of us are experiencing burnout and wellness in the department. And these are all different surveys, different instruments, different scales, and we can banter about what they actually say. The point here is that one in two of us has felt this based on these data of who took the survey. And if you look, you see hotspots. And in particular, I want to call out our advanced practice providers who, during COVID, really stepped up, took on the majority of clinical work, uh, and did this at a significant sacrifice to all of us. So I see this and I wonder, gee, boy, uh, we got real problems in the Department of Medicine. Um, the half good news is that this is not just us. This is data from UCSF that Bob Walker, who is chair of medicine there, shared with me. This is their burnout data across their campus. Medicine is there in the middle. They are trending in the wrong direction as well. Uh, they went from 37% to 44%, perhaps better than us, yes. Uh, but I will tell you that Bob and many other chairs are also concerned about this in their own departments as well. So for those of you thinking of leaving to go to San Francisco, it's not better there. They have the same problems we do. Um, we have been very attentive to this, and I think we've done this in a way behind the scenes that I want to magnify on right now. Um, I brought Sunita in specifically as I thought about wellness in the context of growing people um, and developing people. And I know that all of you have felt that there's been no attention on that in many ways from the department. And I want to amplify content, not just for one person, one track, but across all of our faculty types. So one of Sunita's missions is to create that content so all of you can feel like you can develop the careers you want to develop here in the Department of Medicine. Uh, what she's been most focused on, I will tell you right now, is promotions. Uh, we just went through our promotion cycles. Um, it was almost 110 dossiers that got reviewed between the two committees. It was a lot of work. Um, and it was, again, the same issues with lack of transparency, challenges with decision making. And you will see, I hope, in the next year, uh, more efficient and more transparent processes for promoting uh, your work as well. Uh, I hired Janine specifically for this reason, that we needed more leadership in research. And I brought in Mary and Fernando because it wasn't just around one area of research. It had to be T0, T1, T2 and T3 and T4 as well. I think uh, the approach taken here to listen first before we act is reflective of the maturity and the thought that's going into this process. This is what she's been doing. I don't know how many listening tours have happened. I Too many that I care to count, uh, but they have been listening attentively um, because this will then inform what we do moving forward with our research office, with our programs, with the literally the millions of dollars we spend in our department in research. Uh, we launched a new staff mentorship program. I actually in was invited to give the inaugural talk at that staff mentorship program, probably a highlight of this year for me. I've received nothing but good news about that because staff often get forgotten uh, in this process, and yet they are key to us as well. Uh, and Katie is working on a new intervention that will be coming soon in the next year to amplify many of our Weldon programs. So this is not taken lightly. Uh, I think we should do more here. Frankly, I want to be the leader in the campus when it comes to this work. If our faculty thrive, if our staff and our students thrive, we thrive. It's very simple at the end of the day. We just need to make sure we are doing the right things and lock and step with what our campus needs as well. A key area for me and how I think about this is basically our clinicians. So I showed you all those clinical metrics, all of that data, all of these dollars, they come from our clinical dollars. When you ask the clinician about how we value them, uh, you don't get very good responses. And the truth is there's actually few ways to uh, actually value clinicians. How do you tell them, you're doing great, I'm going to give you a national award? Not that many for our clinicians. Or you're doing great, I'm going to promote you with a process that may not be ideal for their own productivity. So I took a step back and looked at what's happening across the country, and I am pleased to announce the new Department of Medicine Clinical Excellence Society. 
What is this? This is modeled after Michigan and Harvard and Vanderbilt that have similar societies. It's called the Academy Laureati Medici. Uh, it is an honorific society with nominations sol solicited from peers, colleagues, patients, and leaders that recognizes clinical excellence. Let me tell you more about this society. Uh, it is the doctor's doctors. It is the people you would go to and I would go to for our own care. Uh, who live amongst us every day. It is APPs and it is MDs. It is not just one specific group. How do we do this? We got a generous gift from anonymous donor. This goes back to philanthropy and why it's so important. Uh, and that gift allowed us to create this society. We will solicit nominations from divisions through an annual selection process. This will be very competitive, just like the ASCI or the AAP. It's designed to be so. These are the best of the best. We need to have the best of the best in the society. And when they do get elected, they will get honored and recognized at our annual ceremony. They will get a paid one month sabbatical that they can take every five years to go back and building their clinical excellence, whether that's in an area they wanna grow into or an area they wanna develop further. I want this to be so visible and so recognizable that you should be able to spot them a mile away. So how do we do that? They'll get unique lab coats with the logos on their arms. So you'll see them walking around and you'll know who they are. They'll get personalized visiting cards with that logo embossed on it and they will become permanent members of the Clinical Excellence Society, selecting the next crop and the next crop of people uh, who will adorn the walls of our halls as well. And I'm very excited about this because A, I think it's critically important, but B, we're on a fast track here. We're gonna induct our first class in the fall of 2023. So look for nominations, look for announcements coming your way in the first quarter of next year, because next year at this time, I wanna be showing you the pictures of the first few uh, that made the Clinical Excellence Society here in the Department of Medicine. Uh, let's talk about UC Health. Uh, and Liz, I know you're listening. Uh, so thank you for being here. Um, I will start by being very blunt and direct. And I say, this is the elephant in the room. There was not a day that I, when I first got here, that this did not come up in a conversation. And there were several themes around this. Lack of trust and respect. Uh, lack of shared decision-making at the table. This perception that we weren't aligned, that there was only interest in the clinical space, not in all the other academic missions that we are all about and what makes us unique and special, and tension in the relationship, which was palpable uh, a mile away. You know, it's funny, I was coming home and I was thinking about this and there was a song on the radio and uh, the song was uh, Charlie Puth's We Don't Talk Anymore. Uh, very, very apt for where we were because we weren't talking anymore. We had grown so quickly. We had done so many clinical things that we'd lost track of saying, what about all the other missions and how do we support them and how do we talk about them? So when I first got here, I committed to dialogue. And I was very pleased to be able to have this dialogue. These are just uh, some examples of what I've been doing. Bi-weekly meetings with Tom and Pradeepa here at the campus. Monthly discussions with Merle and Robin about our off-campus activities. I meet with Liz monthly to talk about various things. Uh, we now include one another when we recruit to our senior leadership positions. So I'm involved with recruiting Pradeepta. I'm involved with recruiting the new director of rehab. And they're involved with recruiting some of our vice chairs as well. We share that investment up front so that we respect one another with who we select down the road. And what's been really helpful in this is as we thought about it, we needed new venues and new structures to have conversations because this one-off thing was great for medicine. It didn't work for the campus at large. So uh, earlier this year, uh, Tom Gronau and our Dean got together and established the UC Health and CU School of Medicine Executive Advisory Committee. Uh, what is this thing? It is a group of individuals that make all decisions about our healthcare system. So it is led by Tom, President and CEO of UC Health and our Dean on the upper right. The Executive Advisory Committee sits right below them. We advise, we have no decision-making uh, responsibility, but we provide input. And what do we provide input on? We provide input on everything affecting UC Hospital, affecting the entrance medical campus, clinical missions, research missions, education missions, across clinical departments and across basic science departments and across key clinical programs. Um, this has never happened before on our campus. We've had two of these meetings, third one's coming up in January. And I can tell you, it has allowed for us to have that voice about the academic mission and why it matters and how we need to support it going forward as well. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. So let me share some of the pudding with you. Uh, you'll see key clinical programs down here at the bottom. Uh, that basically infers where we're gonna spend the most money in the next five years and what we're gonna grow. There are five key areas that we're gonna grow, cancer, cardiovascular, and transplant medicine. Two of those five are being led by our faculty. So we are not just 
advising, we are leading how these dollars will be spent on campus. And let me tell you, this includes everything from buildings to equipment, to staff, to clinical trials, to education, to fellowships, to DEI activities. It's the whole umbrella of work that happens in this space. So Larry and Wells are leading our cardiology and oncology work. They are putting together a funding ask uh, to span all of our missions. Uh, they will present this to the board at UC Health in January of 2023. They will present it. Um, and our goal of this investment is to be a top 10 academic medical center. And it's important you hear that from me. There's a false dichotomy here about being clinically relevant and not being academically relevant. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a department chair of a clinical department that's clinical work only. We need to grow them all together. Uh, and I think that vision is shared by everyone here. So I'm very excited about this. And I'll talk more about it in the Q&A if you'd like. But I think this is the first time we're coming together to have uh, what I would call these crucial conversations uh, across campus as well. All right, I'll close by telling you what I think about um, our national presence and branding. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, when I first came here, I felt this. I came from a university where uh, the, the, the pitch line is the team, the team, the team. It's all about the team. Um, I didn't feel that as much here. And I sort of wanted to feel this out a little bit. But then um, one of our division chief candidates for GI uh, actually put the slide up in a town hall. So he said, Dr. Chopra says, you want to be known as one of the top departments of medicine in the country. Yes, we do. And then he had two circles on that slide. Uh, circle one was a smaller one. Circle one was, circle was a bigger one. And he said, these two circles represent key sentiments. The first circle is how others see you, see you as the play in words here, uh, and how you see yourselves. I can tell you, I, I thought he lost the job right there uh, at his town hall. But there was some truth to this because the question is, why is this disconnect? Why are we not thumping our chest and talking about all the great work happening in the department nationally, right? When we think of MGH, when we think of Michigan, the Brigham, why, why is Colorado not in there as well? I think one of the reasons we're not in there is because we have humility here in Colorado. We're a very humble society. We like to do our thing and lay low and, and be happy and not worry too much about what others think of us. That's great, but I think that can be paired with aggressive national branding. And that will be my focus in the next few years. And how are we doing that? I mentioned U.S. News and World Ranking. We can agree to disagree about whether or not they're true ranking systems. They matter. Uh, people look at that. Recruits look at that. Students look at that. Our faculty look at that. Uh, and so we are working very closely, Michael Ho and I, with our leaders on the system side and on the campus side to look at doximity and focus on our national rankings. I want to see that go up because I truly believe we should be higher than where we are. So that's goal number one. Goal number two is that we need to be more proud of our accomplishments and we need to have a document or something that says, look, this is what's happening in the Department of Medicine. So this year, I commissioned a firm in Michigan to actually help create our annual reports. This will be big. It will be thick. And I want it to go to every resident, every student, every trainee, every faculty member, every recruit, every donor, every department on campus so that they know all of the good things that are happening here on campus. I do not wanna be the best kept secret on the campus here anymore, right? So this annual report, I'm spending a lot of time and energy on. I know our division chiefs have been doing the same as well. I think this will be the start of a new approach to how we think about ourselves and how others see us in Colorado. And I know all of you love your Twitter feeds, uh, even though bad things are happening there, whether you like it or not, we have to amplify our, our social media presence. Uh, and we are doing a lot of work in that space as well. Here's a sneak peek of our new potential cover for the annual Department of Medicine. I'm staying with the Colorado themes. We're gonna go to new heights, lots of figures, lots of graphs, lots of data. Uh, and I'm very excited. I hope to be able to share this with you very, very soon. Uh, and I mentioned social media and I wanna call out Amy Bucci who's here in the back who has done incredible work here. Uh, there's three focuses. There's Twitter, there's YouTube, and there's ViewMedi. Our Twitter following has gone up significantly. That's that blue line. Uh, our YouTube subscribers have gone up by almost 200 people with increasing in watch time. And we've increased our view Medi uh, play time over the year by almost fivefold. Um, that's happening with some very intentional work and some very thoughtful feedback. I meet with Amy every couple of weeks. We look at statistics, we look at data. We think about how people are perceiving us uh, in the social space. So more to come there. And for those of you who tweet, please do tag me. Happy to retweet, get the word out there because we need to do that as well. And, and I'll close with this. I think it's really important for us to be seen nationally, for others to come look at us and think about what how we compare it to other programs. So uh, I am going to begin work to commission an external review of the department. 
Uh, we last did this almost a decade ago, uh, and it was very informative. And what this is, is we get chairs and other leaders from pure academic medical centers. They come to Colorado, they spend several days with us. They meet with division heads, program leaders, look at all of our, our front roles, and they create a SWOT document, an analysis of our strengths and our weaknesses and where our opportunities are. Uh, and that report, I hope, will form a blueprint for us as we move the department forward in thinking about our development and efforts. And I suspect that will happen in the next 12 to 18 months. All right, so I've talked a lot, I'm gonna wrap up. Uh, I wanna start close by saying, look, I think we've endured a lot of challenges over the past two years. Uh, I wanna emphasize that despite these challenges, the state of our department is incredibly strong. Uh, I think we are really well positioned to make important advances across all of our missions. And I want us all to be proud of the things happening here each and every single day. I firmly believe our best days lie ahead and I'll close with a picture of our faculty uh, and I'll close with the words I like to say, which is onwards. Uh, thank you all very much. Happy to take questions and answers. I know we don't have much time, but if, we, uh, if there are questions there, please do email them to me as well. Would love to engage in dialogue. Thank you. We're open to the audience now for questions for Dr. Chopra. We can start with one from online. We're waiting for one here, which is um, somebody asked, uh, a lot of faculty members on this campus do great work, but they may not be known for that great work. How do they get in front of philanthropic donors yeah. and be a part of that growth? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the way we do that, I think, is by recognizing, A, that the great work is happening at the local unit and divisional level. So I think it's incumbent upon our divisional leaders to highlight that work, number one. Number two is to actually get it to our hands and get it to the hands of our philanthropy folks. Our philanthropy team and our advancement team meets with our division heads every month. They're part of our division head meetings now. So they listen and they hear and they're looking for stories. And I think the third thing which is important for faculty to hear is don't be shy. Um, if you're doing great work and you feel like it's making a difference in someone's life, elevate that voice up to your supervisor and leader. We have to create a culture around this. This is uncomfortable for many of us. Um, it certainly was uncomfortable for me when I first started doing it. But the truth is people actually want to support the missions and the work and the people. Uh, and if you think you're doing great work, elevate that voice up so we can hear it. Hey, Todd. Vinny, uh, thanks for that that talk. It's a lot of exciting things going on and a lot of energy going in uh, going into it. Question, um, you, uh, you, so we're talking about growth, opportunities for growth. And of course, one of the things that we struggle against here now is space. Um, and uh, kind of your thoughts yeah. on uh, how, how you see the DOM sort of moving out into the community. Uh, we're building more towers, but those aren't gonna be ambulatory space, that sort of thing. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, Todd, that's great. Um, Todd's question, by the way, the, the speakers were crackling was around space and how I think about that in the department. Yeah, this is a real concern, uh, Todd, as you know. Um, there's been conversations happening on the university side on clinical space in particular about how we grow that. And around Tower 3, they've opened up more shell space and have committed to actually having more clinical space there because our volume cannot match our current ability in many ways, including in pulmonary, as you know. Um, I'm also concerned about our research space. Uh, when we came to Aurora 15 years ago, there was this allure of, boy, look at all the space we have. I think we're rapidly going to end up hitting glass ceilings there. Uh, I'm grateful to Peter Buttrick, another one of our faculty members who's gone through this research reorganization process. I know it's been painful, um, but I think that's the key space uh, issue in the labs is gonna be around where we invest and how we actually co-locate people so that they're actually using the same space more effectively and more efficiently. Uh, and I think the last thing I worry about is office space. Uh, this has been a key concern in AOB, uh, for example. Uh, we are on, we've talked about it several times. I think we need to move forward in forming what's called a space committee. Um, I look at offices, I'm here every day. I see a lot of empty offices where people aren't showing up. Um, the Division of General Medicine went through this process. They actually looked at badging data. Uh, and who was coming into the building and not coming into the building and using their offices. Mm -hmm. And when they weren't, they reached out and said, hey, we wanna let you know, we're not seeing you here on campus a lot, what's going on. Some of those people have moved on actually. So that was interesting that we still had office space for people that were no longer here. I think there was at least one case where someone had passed uh, and the office was still there. Um, so there's some cleanup we need to do, I think is the bottom line. Um, the other opportunity I think that exists is in the CU Medicine building across the parking lot from here where there's a lot of empty space. We know has offices there that have been very helpful. And I think we need to look to expand some of our dry space there uh, for more office areas. Uh, last but not least, I'll say uh, Wells, Messersmith has pioneered this for us. He spends most of his time in the cloud and in the hub. 
uh, in terms of sort of landing space. Uh, he actually likes it. He thinks it makes a lot of sense to be able to jump in and jump out when you like. I, I think those resources need to be explored further, potentially even increased and amplified more. Because more and more of our faculty are here certain days of the week uh, and not here all the time. And we need to be more effective and efficient about how we give them spaces to work. Um, so long answer to your question. I am concerned about this. I think both on the clinical side, there have been dialogue and discussions, no clear future yet for that, but it is on everyone's map. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I think we need to be very thoughtful about the clinical work that has, happens here versus what happens elsewhere. Thanks, Todd. You probably have time for one last question, so we'll take another online question. Um, the question is about growing community yeah. in the light of all the clinical growth. Uh, obviously, they could run counter to one another. How are we going to continue to foster community as we grow larger? How are we going to increase community across the uh, sites that are already distant to one another physically? Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, there's a short answer and a long answer to that question. I think the short answer is with intentionality. Uh, I don't think it'll happen unless we're laser focused on it. Um, uh, especially in our clinical uh, workflows, uh, you show up to work early, you work your day off, you go home. Um, uh, Inner Mountain calls it pajama time. You open up your computer and your pajamas and you're doing your inbox at the end of the day. It can feel pretty isolating. Um, and I think we need to come up with ways to actually recognize that work. That's what the CES, I hope, will do. Um, and ways to actually celebrate that work, which I think also the CES will do. Um, I think the other piece of it is really being thoughtful and deliberate about how we come together. Um, so I mentioned the faculty recognition event. I was actually pretty surprised at the number of people that showed up that night. I think we had close to over 100 people there as well. Um, and I think we need to do more of that to create that social connectivity between one of us. I, I don't think we're ever going to go out from this virtual hybrid world anytime soon. And the risk, therefore, there is that we will always be in this gap between us. And the only way we come around it on the clinical side uh, is to actually bring people back together. Uh, so that's something that we have to do more intentionally going forward. Thank you for that question. All right, I think we're right at one o'clock. So uh, I'll say for the audience, uh, not only for the talk, but thank you for your leadership, Dr. Trevor. Thank you, Dr. Connor.